did do that. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Um, no, it's awesome to be here. Um, I'm Danielle, and uh, so honored to be invited to speak to you. I recently started my first startup. About six months ago, I started Referly, and crazy thing happened. Applied to Y Combinator the morning of the deadline and got in. So we just wrapped up Y Combinator, and whenever I do a talk, I have like a little existential crisis. Like, well, what am I going to tell these people? Like, they know more than me. I should probably find a time to talk to every single one of you. Um, and I figured, what, what have I learned at this point that I could actually share that might be unique? And I think there's this whole set of things people don't talk about with startups. Um, so I'll just talk about it. Um, you're probably really bad at picking what to work on every day. This is the number one thing I've learned as a CEO. I've only been a CEO six months, so maybe this is totally wrong. But let's tell you what I figured out. I wake up and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? What is my job exactly now? Like, <laughs> And then I, my, my old boss was our CEO at Twilio. I emailed him, I'm like, this is hard. He's like, it's gonna get harder. I'm like, thanks, thanks, that's great advice. I'm glad you're invested in our company. Um, so I was like, I'm bad at this. I'm really bad at picking. Before, in other jobs, I didn't have to decide. Someone else called the shots for me. Working at McDonald's, it's like, if they want an Egg McMuffin, give them an Egg McMuffin. Do you work on a blog? Oh, I got a poster, no one's gonna, come to my site and no one's gonna click my ads and I'm not gonna make any money and I'm gonna go broke. Um, pretty much every job, someone is calling the shots. And you might be thinking, okay, well your VCs are calling the shots now, right? Because you've taken some money. It's like, no, they're like, yeah, you better figure that out. It's kind of your job. So how do you choose the shots? Um, and more importantly, instead of telling you like what things you should do, like a bullet point list, I'm not gonna do that. It's more about what's getting in the way of you calling the shots. Um, all my slides, by the way, have, have guns on them. They don't have any plan. We'll just see what comes up next. Because <laughs> this is how I make decks. I don't really like decks very much, but this is really cool. Um, so you can just look at it while I talk about calling the shots. So um, the problem you probably have, if you're like me, or the problem I have is I am too nice. And I'm from Seattle, so by the way, my nice is not your nice. You've got Midwest nice. I've got passive aggressive nice. <laughs> and I'm stuck with it. I live in the Bay Area now, but it's still with me. So it's like you kind of have to figure out which one you're going to be. You either have to just be totally nice or be aggressive. And I was thinking, like, when does nice work and, and could it work for me now? So I was thinking back. And I have been steamrolled a lot. I mean, we all have. Like, we do things and we're, like, not in charge and it's frustrating. And I look at some of my youngest employees and I kind of see them feel that way and I try to figure out, like, oh, how do I fix that for them or how do I get them where they need to go? But, like, going back to McDonald's, which is my, the best job ever, so easy, it's just unbelievable. Um, being nice works really well at McDonald's. It's just like, that's all you need to do is like do the job, input, output, smile, that's it. It's a great job. Being nice works um, in customer service, it works as a receptionist, it works as a barista. Most, because the job is just like, you can just do the job, you also have to think about it, and just being nice is great. Then I went and worked in a Fortune 500 company. Being nice doesn't work very well. Turns out, being nice, We'll get you lots of friends, and you'll be good at politics, but your project's probably not going to get done. And I was so frustrated. I spent three years in a shipping company. And I was like, man, why can't I get anyone to adopt Java? Like, that's how far back in time we were. Um, so being nice stopped working, but I didn't know. So that was the first like, job where I, I had no idea why I was frustrated, did some cool stuff, but I was still being very nice. Then I did my first startup. Being nice in a startup in my opinion, is the biggest problem that most people face. Like, it is the biggest problem, because what happens is you get this long list of stuff you said yes to doing. Oh yeah, I'll totally do that. Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, this, 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 this. Being nice basically is like, you can't say no. Like, what is wrong with you? And then someone comes along, like, um, a bunch of our speakers are gonna give you very good advice, like things you wanna draw a box and a list of things next to, and you don't have any room in your list for those things, because you said yes to everything else. So you have to start saying, like, no. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to read email. I haven't read email in six days, by the way. Um, Jeff, I think, texted me to make sure I was still coming. Um, because I should be coding right now. Like, that is the thing I have to do. And, like, just not responding to those emails is a very subtle no. So I'm not paying attention to that today. You want to wake up and say yes to something that actually matters. And I feel like it's so easy to just do the stuff you did before. So I was a marketing person my, at Twilio for three years. 
So it's so easy to just do marketing. I've always done marketing. It's comfortable. I know what to do. I'll feel good. Um, my startup will die long term if I just do that. But I can like not think about that for six months or something. But that's, that's being nice. And the other option sounds like be a bitch. Like, isn't, does that mean she's just a total bitch? Like in the office? Like, no, no, fuck no. Like, <laughs> actually, that's not the problem. The problem is just not saying yes. Like, if you don't have this massive list of stuff that you said you would do, you don't have this massive pile of guilt that you're like hauling along to the airport that you're like, oh, I didn't do those emails, didn't follow up with those customers. Um, but okay, so that's, that's the ideal situation, but that's not the situation any of us are in because we all have this problem. So then what do you do? Um, my suggestion, and I'm gonna try not to give too much prescriptive advice, is in order to take the advice of all the other awesome people that you're gonna meet at this conference, maybe you should cross some things off your list permanently and make some room for the other stuff that, that would actually matter. So like, what's the basis for crossing stuff off the list? Turns out you've gotta be really judgmental. That's another like, kind of bitchy characteristic. Like, oh, I gotta judge things. I gotta judge people. I gotta judge projects. I've gotta judge campaigns. Like, you kind of do need to judge stuff. Like, because if you're not judging it, then no one's judging it. You're just doing random stuff. So what is the basis for judging? Like, in previous jobs, I felt like basically I could be like, was this gonna get me promoted? Yeah, I'll do it. That doesn't really work in a startup. Because like, where are you gonna get promoted? Who's promoting you? You're gonna promote yourself? You're gonna send yourself on vacation? Maybe. Uh, but the bigger thing is that you actually have to have a measurement for why would you say yes to something. Um, and there's all these metrics you can use. But the fundamental thing should be, does it mean that you're not gonna die? Like, right? Like, if, it's, if, it's, if you're gonna be the same tomorrow as you are today, that's inertia. And inertia in startup is a death sentence. So for me, I've started just literally not doing things that aren't gonna make it better tomorrow. And people have an interesting reaction to this. And this is like, I think, proving that I'm way too nice. People are like, are you mad at me? No, I'm not mad at you, why? Oh, you haven't written back to my email in three weeks. Well, if I wrote back to you, would my startup have more users tomorrow? Sorry. That, yeah, that's it, that's, like, that's the whole thing. And like, then you have to do that 100 times a day, or in my case, 450 emails a day. Um, so that's like the biggest thing I've learned. And it's kind of depressing, because like now I'm basically telling you like you can't be nice people anymore. But that's not actually what I'm saying. I'm saying you don't need to be nice to be successful at your startup. You should be decent, be really good, be moral, but I don't want to be the person where they're like, oh, Danielle, she's such a nice CEO. I don't want to be the nice CEO. And I think I, I valued that. I think I said that about people. And I realize now, like, that's not the thing you want to be. I really would like people to be like, man, she gets shit done, or she gets customers, or any of these like very real things that are actual results in a business. And then I want my employees, you know, people say, well, what about your employees? Like, are you going to be mean to them? Like, no, but like maybe they would say more than just that I'm nice. Maybe she gives me really good feedback, or she really invests in me. Like, being nice is just such a shallow piece of feedback. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't tell you anything about if it's working or not. Um, so this has like one other thing that you should think about. I have a six-person company. And my husband is one of my co-founders. So this like adds some interesting pers interpersonal complexity, right? These people aren't my friends. They work with and for me. And that is weird. That is really weird. And that is like another big part of being nice is like I could just treat them like we've known each other forever and I worry about, you know, how was your date last night? And, and I do care, but there's this difference between caring about it and it being like high school in my office. And I think these are just the things I don't feel people talk about when you're becoming a leader for the first time. Uh, and I think it's a real big problem because I think if you don't address it, situations come up where you've let things slide too much in the friend direction or too much in the nice understanding direction. Suddenly you've got a performance issue. Suddenly you've got an interpersonal issue. Suddenly someone files for sexual harassment and you're their friend and how are you gonna deal with that entanglement? Um, and I think 
this is this is bigger problem than like getting customers because you don't even have them yet. This is pre-customers. This is pre-everything. This is just you're building your company, you're figuring it out, and what's your relationship with everyone. So shot selection. What are the shots you're going to call that really matter? I'll start with the one that people don't talk about again, quitting. So when you're, not, when you're really nice, quitting is like not an option. Like, I don't want to let those people down. I can't quit. I better should bring up a new gun. Um, what's the shot to make? Quality versus quantity. Like, I, this one shoots, like, think six bullets at a time. Like, should I try to shoot six bullets and, like, maybe one of them will hit the target? Should I hit one, like, really big one? This could be a uh, metaphor for do I try six little marketing campaigns or one big product launch that takes six months? Um, again, being nice very likely you're going to say, oh, we should try all six. I don't, want to, I don't want to say no to any of your ideas. Like, let's just try them all, because I'm a nice person. Um, doubling down. I wonder what we'll get this one. Yeah, doubling down. That's just amazing to find that. So doubling down. Oh, that thing's working, but you don't want to double down because you want to work, go work on something new and shiny and sexy? OK, we won't double down on SEO, even though it's driving all of our traffic and we could just spend the next six months on it. Um, oh yeah, this one, outworking others. So nice people are like, oh, we should all go home at six. Like, oh, I feel bad for the team. If I don't go home, they won't go home. It's like, it's a startup. It's okay to be like doing 16 hour days. Like, that's what this is. And I'm saying these things because, and you're probably thinking like, man, she's intense. Like, I don't know if I don't work for her. I don't know if I want to run my startup that way. But all these things, I made all these mistakes. And all they did was slow me down. And the whole point of shot selection is that you actually have limited time, period. Like, limited time in life, obviously, but limited time till money runs out or your team gives up on you or the market's not going to happen. So shot selection is really important. And uh, if you are too nice and use these as kind of cop-outs, then it's very unlikely that you're going to make it. And that's really freaking scary. Uh, as a first-time CEO, you're like, oh, I might not be able to pay these paychecks? Wow, I guess we better make the right, to call the right shots. So actually, like, it is ultimately quite nice to be not nice, because the ultimate goal gets served. Um, so on the flip side, going back to crossing things off the list, it's like, how many things are you saying no to that would actually be better? The biggest person saying no is probably just you. That was like, in my head, I'm just like, no, that won't work. Shut it down. Don't even start on it. Um, and I was going to quote all these people that I feel like when you quote them in a talk, just sort of immediately undermine the credibility. So let me tell you who they are. Just I won't quote them. I'll just tell you who they are. Tom Cruise movies, um, Steve Jobs quotes in general, uh, and, oh, I feel bad saying this, but uh, Dale Carnegie quotes. Um, sorry, he said one earlier, I think. Um, <laughs> So I'll quote an employee of mine instead. Uh, so he quit. That really sucked. That's like the worst thing. That's the worst feeling. He quit, and I was like, OK, I understand you want to quit and travel the world, but like, why? And he said, well, I never got to do the stuff I wanted to work on. I was like, John, you can do whatever you want. You have, uh, he was a remote employee. His job is to go out and evangelize Twilio. He can come up with anything he wants as long as he, like, hits like some baseline amount of content production. And he was like, well, I just never got to work on the projects I wanted to work on. And I asked, asked him, well, why? What happened? Like, did I tell you you couldn't? No. Did you um, feel like they weren't going to make an impact? No. Well, why? He's like, I just told myself no. And then he's like in the conversation. He says, oh, yeah, I'm the one who told myself no. I couldn't do these things. Um, so needless to say, him quitting was probably good for both of us because he's now working on GitHub and he's doing amazing stuff and he's not telling himself no and he's taking the lead. But I think that was a big realization for me. I, was, I do that all the time too. So things to stop doing specifically, if you're gonna cross them off, I have suggestions for things to cross off. Um, Time-wasting investors, number one. Cross it off if you've met with them more than four times and you still haven't gotten an answer, they're not gonna invest in you. Just cross it off the list. Um, Hiring. So if you don't have any money, you just should stop. Just stop. Go build something that can actually like either get 
the investor money or get people who want to come on board for no money because they want to be your co-founder. But just stop. Like These are check boxes. These are like CEO check boxes. You're like, oh, if I do these things, I'm a good CEO. Well, uh, not always. So consider that one. Um, the other thing to stop doing is firing. So sometimes when things aren't going well, I feel like it's very easy to be like, okay, who's the weakest, weakest link in this chain? Fuck, like, I gotta get rid of this person, this person, this mythical person. You're like, I gotta just eliminate someone, and they'll feel better. That's so stupid. Don't do that either. I mean, that sounds evil probably when I say it like that, but people really do think these things, and you will think them. Um, another thing to stop doing, stop building more product. If you have a ton of product, like if you've got an overbuilt product that no one's using, probably shouldn't build any more product. Maybe you should like kill some features. Maybe you should try to market that thing. It's funny, I'm listing all the things startups do and I'm telling you to stop doing them. But probably there's something here. Um, maybe you should stop doing marketing, especially if you're spending a lot of money on it. So you're marketing, you're spending like five grand a month, you're just getting things off the ground with some ad campaigns and stuff and a lot of the other stuff is content and it's not working. Maybe you should stop. Maybe, maybe all that traffic you're getting from AdWords that isn't converting is just a graph up and to the right that doesn't mean anything. Maybe you should stop doing that. Um, and the last one, and I know this is like probably a very Silicon Valley thing to say, so I'm sorry in advance, is maybe you should stop trying to get revenue. Because maybe by trying to get revenue in some really small way, you're completely eliminating the thing that actually would be a really exciting business. Like trying to make 100 bucks a week like, why even bother if you're trying to create a business that's somehow going to scale to like be worth, you know, $100 million? So these are the distractions of a CEO. These are the things that I like try very hard to cross off the list if they don't actually work. Um, that's really all I have in terms of being nice. I feel like, especially as a woman saying this, is something that it's just not talked about. And I don't think it's going to be completely possible for me to convey what this means for me, like, to stop being nice in this way. But um, if you know any women founders or women people in startups and you give it, get a chance to chat with them about kind of how they feel with the interpersonal stuff on their team, I think this is a really helpful conversation. I realize that it's not um, as a actionable, but I think that there's something here. Um, I think I'm just gonna open up for questions just so you guys know what things you might ask me about that would help you. I have mostly a background in customer acquisition and marketing. Uh, Twilio is a developer marketing platform, or sorry, developer marketing tool um, for making and receiving phone calls and texts via API. So if you want to hear about developer marketing, I can help on that. Um, really quickly, just what Referly is, because I, I should tell you and I would really like your feedback. So we're a very, very early stage team. Um, and we make it so you can recommend products to people. And then if people buy products through your recommendations, you get paid a commission. So the idea is, wouldn't it be cool if people who already recommend products all the time can make 100 bucks a month? And there's lots and lots of people who spend hours and hours every day online just talking about products. So also very interested in social commerce if you want to ask questions on that. But generally open to answering anything. So thank you. Run. If you guys have questions, again, please line up. We have a microphone over here and a microphone over there. I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, um, I, it relates to a Dale Carnegie quote. Um, <laughs> oh, that's I'm, I tease. Uh, my question for you is you mentioned earlier about um, you have limited time and, and about shot selection. So for you and your business and the ones you worked in previously, how do you go about determining what's most important, which, which features to eradicate? Is it simply metrics? Is it, a, is it a gut? Is it intuition, talking to advisors, et cetera? So at this point, we, we're at a, we have enough going on where you have metrics. So we look at how much traffic are we driving, signups, people activating. So for us, that means they recommend their first product, and then how much revenue do they generate. So each of that's a funnel, basically. And each of the things in the, in the funnel needs to be healthy to be ultimately driving the revenue for our business. Um, so generally, the metric raises a red flag, but it doesn't tell you what to do. So I think the gut comes into play where you're like, well, for example, I think right now 30% of the people who sign up for Referly actually share their first product recommendation and we think that that would be good if that's a lot higher because that really means only 30% of our users are real users. Um, so at that point you're like, well, why? And you have to just kind of begin to test ideas and, and make guesses. 
Hi, thanks for the talk. It's great, really informative. Uh, my name is Ben Barth. I'm with Homes for Hackers from Kansas City. Uh, my question is, uh, so with you being less nice or not being nice at all to, uh, to your employees, <laughs> um, how does that work in the culture of the startup you've built? Um, so do you find uh, your employees are being less nice to each other, and is that a positive thing or a negative thing? So, for example, with you not checking email um, for six days or a couple weeks, whatever, do you find your employees then start not checking email, and that's a good thing because they're getting stuff done? And um, how, does, how does that work, and is it good or bad? Hmm. So I think the answer to your question is I don't know yet uh, because I haven't been doing it that long, but I think the important thing I would point out is Hopefully they'll emulate the spirit of it and not the specific ways that I do it. So for example, I may not need to answer email, but uh, someone who's in customer support certainly should, but she may also need to like, not do something else. So I, I, I hope that I'm pointing out that I'm working on the most important things, but the reality is I don't know. I do think one thing uh, in our culture that is interesting, and culture is, is new too, everything is new, um, is we, we debate a lot. Um, and we really try to base decisions around rational debate instead of like kind of relationships and politics. Uh, I don't know if that's about being nice or something else, but I like that and I would be really cool to create a company where as we get larger, that continues to be the case. Hey, Danielle. Hi. Um, so about four or five years ago, you were in shoes similar to mine, the editor of a, of a local tech blog yep. out in Seattle, Seattle 2.0. Um, then you moved on to uh, Twilio, you ended up moving to the Bay Area. What was it, and I've kind of followed your career, what was it that said, no, I'm going to do this on my own, I'm going to go out and do it? I mean, you had a great position at Twilio as the first employee, as the director of marketing, I think, at the end. Jeff uh, Lawson, you got to work with, um, and that really a good things going on with Twilio, you leave, you do refer early. Can you talk to me about that decision? Sure. So. Um you do know my career quite well. Um, so I did manage Seattle 2.0, which is a, very similar to Silicon Prairie News, but really just for the Pacific Northwest. So it covers Portland, um, Seattle, Boise, um, kind of also some of the mountain states. Um, so I think it kind of comes down to every step in the path was leveling up. So first I was just doing this, this blog, and then I was a community manager, and I learned some Emacs and I learned some MySQL, and suddenly I was like building little things. Um, and then at Twilio, it's a web API, so I had to learn to be a, a real developer there. I think there's just this unbelievable pull to make things yourself. Like as soon as you can, as soon as you have the tools and you've made something, it's like so addictive. Um, and you begin to form opinions about how to make things once you can make things, which when you can't make them, it's just like magical that things come into existence. Like, I don't know how to solder together a phone. I really appreciate electronics because they're completely foreign to me as a maker, but I can build a website. Um, and I think ultimately being a founder was about, like, I want to make this thing exactly how I want it. And I want to make something people want, of course, but I want to be the one who gets to control that experience. Like, that will be my little way of, like, my little corner of the universe is, like, mine. And I never really felt full ownership of that until it was mine. And I, maybe that makes me a control freak, but I think I would be willing to be called that by every person on the planet to be able to like, get up and that's what I do. And the second thing is I love that I can also control the environment in which that's made. So to the point about company culture, creating a place where people want to work every day is so cool. Like, just the idea that of all the, like, say that you sitting right here, you, like, you work on my team. Like, the idea that you would want to get up in the morning and of all the things you could do, you would, like, come to the office. Like, I still kind of am shocked that people come to the office. Like, like you want to come to my office? Like, that is such an honor. So those two things, that, like, combine just, uh, I just don't think there's any bigger high than that. And I get, I don't know, I'm, ram I'm rambling. I just love it. It's so awesome. Uh, and since I do have another question on my mind, uh, and since no one's behind me, I'll ask it quick. <laughs> um, with Twilio, uh, when I cover startup weekends or just out talking with people, it seems as if Twilio is something that people love and want to tell people about, even though they don't really know what it is or they don't <laughs> use it themselves. Like a startup weekend, if you're at that, if you're at a table visiting with somebody, they'll say, "Oh, how can we use Twilio? You know, well, what is it? Well, I don't know. It's cool." 
Um, so what did you do, and, and, and I'm sure you want to do this with referrally, but yeah. can you give me uh, like the rundown that, of how that happened at, at Twilio, how you kind of aimed for that, or maybe you didn't even aim for that, but I remember also meeting you and you just throw Twilio shirts to everyone and, and people would wear them even, again, they don't know really what it is or how they use it. Yeah, so Twilio is a developer product and traditionally, I don't know exactly what the breakdown is of the audience here, but if you're a developer, you know that developer tools, generally you mention them to someone else. Like if you use Visual Studio, people don't know what that is, or uh, an API. It's just not really commonly publicly known. Um, with Twilio, I think the truth is that we didn't aim for it necessarily, but what I think something that happened that's really special about Twilio is the product is for the phone. And anything where the makes the phone ring is like universally understood. Because everyone has a phone. It is the most ubiquitous device in the world. And I think we didn't get the, the power of that. So people get excited that you can make the phone ring. And that's real. Like They totally get that. Um, I think the thing that ultimately happened is just we told a million stories. Like all these cool things that people were doing. So then people didn't have to know how it worked. They were just like, oh, you guys were had inside of a chip that went to like space and took pictures on the way down and tweeted locations so they could do reconnaissance on a like space balloon. That's cool. I have no clue how any of that works, but I saw the pictures and they were cool and I love that Twilio is associated with that. So I think we did a lot to tie our brand to things that were amazing. Um, generally, people recognize great things even when they don't know how they work. Um, if you tell great stories. I think that's the job of marketing. I, I think we have a long way to go at Twilio. Twilio is a product that could be used by millions and millions of developers and completely change telecom. So to be clear, like the battle's not won. I left that company pretty early to start my own thing, but I think that's just, part of it is the opportunity of Twilio. People get it. You could build, all, you could make the phone ring in a million different ways. Hi. Hey, Danielle, I'm Sloan Scott. I'm a the only female partner in a new startup um, for, out of Nashville, Tennessee called Flow Thinkery. And one of the things I wanted to ask you sort of as a, as a female co-founder um, and as a partner, one of the things that's sort of an interesting dynamic that happens is, and it would be interesting to hear your experience, is sort of how you went about funding your startup. So it, as far as Flow Thinkery is concerned, we all, we bootstrapped it. We didn't take any outside VC money. We didn't take any PE money. Nothing like that. We just decided to start going and build and see if we had something. And we're about 10 months in and not quite cash flow positive yet, but we're working on it. So I'd just love to hear sort of your experience and how you decided to go ahead and do this in terms of from a, a funding perspective. Wow, you're, you're close to cash flow positive. It, uh, trust me, like that's, that's so much better than funding. Um, wow. So how I approached funding, um, I just asked. Like literally I picked a small set of people, angels, and just asked initially, like I had no idea. Maybe they would say, no, you're crazy, or maybe they would say yes. I think I was lucky. I had a few people say yes early that allowed me to quit my job. Um, it's interesting you pose this as like as a woman, because I, I know there's a lot of debate out there, like do women have a harder time raising money? Um, and I don't know, I haven't. We raised quite a bit, I mean for a seed round, we'll announce it soon. Um, but I also was very aggressive about it. So I, this is really not PC thing to say. I kind of thought like, what would a man do? Like, like okay, 95% of the guys who walk in these boardrooms are guys, 95% of the founders like, so this is not about my gender, this is a pattern matching thing. So it's like, what are they doing? What should I do? Because it's not actually, it's just, you kind of throw people off, you're different. So they assume like one thing's different, maybe some other things will be different. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I can say about that. I also didn't, like the time waster thing I mentioned, is really, 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 really important. Like going through YC, that was one of the most important things to emphasize, is like if people aren't going to invest in you, move on, there are so many investors in the world. And I think what we, maybe as women, I don't know, I don't wanna say that women do this, because I don't wanna believe it, but maybe it's true, if you go to, Investors in general, like, please, please, will you, like, take care of me and nurture my startup? Please, like, will you fund me? I think that's when it doesn't work. I think it's got to be, like, I've got value. I want to make a trade with you. If you think this could make you a lot of money, invest. And if not, we'll talk in, you know, five, seven years when I'm IPOing this company and raising some more money. Welcome. 
Hi, Danielle. Um, so I've read some of the things you've written about being a growth hacker, and I thought that maybe you could touch on what you think it means to do growth hacking, and what are some of the key learnings you um, could provide others about how marketing is reinventing itself, and that they can apply if you have kind of a zero marketing budget as a startup. Sure. So zero marketing budget is key to what you just said. So growth hacking, for those of you who haven't heard, I don't know if it's actually defined, but it's just this idea of, of marketers as um, taking a scientific approach to acquiring customers, so running a hypothesis, testing it, getting results, rinse and repeat. I think the most important thing is rinse and repeat. Um, I notice a lot of people, I get a lot of email, Danielle, can you help me with my marketing of my company? Um, I don't really read email right now, so I wonder how many there are, but uh, the number one thing I do is ask people, what's already working for you? And they'll invariably have found one cool thing that's working. So I always ask them, like, well, why don't you just do more of that thing? And people are so disappointed by that answer. They're like, you're a marketing person. You're supposed to tell me all these other things. I'm like, the things have been figured out. Like, the things are just a list. The things are things. There's lots of things. You can always come up with more things. Um, I think the first and most important thing would be double down on stuff that works hardcore. Like, if something is working, like contests are working and you're getting a ton of engagement, well, how can you run 10 contests in the same time you ran one? Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is test more stuff than you think makes sense. So lots of your tests are just going to fail immediately, like fail within the first couple of days even. You're just going to get no response, no interest. Um, you should just kill them and move on, but so you need to run a lot more tests than you think. So I'll ask teams like, how many hypotheses are you testing? Hypotheses. And they'll say, oh, three. Three? I'm testing 25. Like, and they're not big things. Literally, this could be do I have share buttons or not in a certain part of the site? Or do I post one kind of content or another type of content to Twitter? But thinking about the test is like not a huge thing, but it's small things you're testing and listing them, enumerating them. So that's the second thing. The third thing is, and this is the last one, stuff that did not work before may work now. So go back to all the stuff that failed, and if you think there's some hunch in your gut that that could be different now, try it again. I made the mistake of not retesting things for three years in some cases, and I really probably missed out. So those are the three. Thank you. Let's give it up for Danielle, please. Thank you.